Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome once again. I'm Evelyn Moon. I am Director of Learning and Content Strategy here at Good Grief. And I, as always, want to start from a place of gratitude. I am so grateful for this opportunity to spend time with each and every one of you today. If we get pulled in so many directions and the fact that you're taking an hour out of your afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you are, to spend time with us is just so meaningful. So whether you are watching this live right now or later on in YouTube, it is as always an honor. So today is part of our Good Grief community webinar series. Every school year, we bring you content experts, artists and writers as well, and information because we want to extend the work that we do outside of our centers and into the hands of everyone else out there in the virtual space. And I want to say up front, anyone who attended today's live session will receive a certificate of attendance that will likely go out tomorrow, but at least within the next 48 hours. And if you're interested, we can make a PDF available of the slides. That's a question we get frequently. We're happy to share that. So I'm going to get going and tell you a little bit about Good Grief. So some of you may know us, but for those of you who are new, we are a nonprofit organization that's been around since 2004. And our mission is to build resilience in children, strengthen families, and empower communities to grow from loss and adversity. So for most of the organization's history, we have been providing completely free and unlimited peer support programming to grieving children and their families. We do that in our centers. We have the one here in Princeton, which is where I'm sitting currently in our teen center. We also have our Morristown location. That's our original location, a little bit north of here. And also through our virtual sessions um, where we support grieving children and everyone else in their household. But we've been growing. We've been working with schools, hospitals, healthcare settings, the funeral industry, private corporations. We just want to reach the broader community and be able to support the needs of children and families who are facing any kind of loss and adversity. So I won't go through every single thing that we do, but I will give you this big picture snapshot our family support services is the work that we do in our centers. We have our schools work. We also do some in-person training, our Good Grief Spring Institute, which we host every year at the Pingree School in Basking Ridge. So look for us in March of 2024 for that. PD, parent and caregiver education, youth and funerals initiative, and then webinars, which you're here. So welcome. Uh, this is sort of the foundation of everything that we do. We really focus on peer support. You know, we believe in building up the supportive relationships in a young person's life and also fostering those adaptive skills. Um, so before I say anything else about Good Grief, I would like to welcome our presenter. So this is our presenter, Chanel Brenner, award-winning poet and writer. Um, she is the winner of the 2021 Press 53 Award for Poetry for her book, Smile or Else. I love that title. She is also the author of Vanilla Milk, a memoir told in poems. Her essays and poems have appeared in The Rumpus, Tahoma Literary Review, um, Her Story, Literary Mama, Modern Loss. We love Modern Loss around here. Rebecca Sofer is a good friend of ours. Rattle, Spoon River, and others. Her poem Apology won first place in the Smartish Pace, the Lula Rose Poetry Prize. I got that out. And she lives in Los Angeles with her husband and son. So welcome. Hi, I'm so Hi. happy, so happy to be here. Um, thank you for having me. I'm grateful to be able to share my um, experience with loss and um, write my experience with writing and a writing prompt today. Wonderful. So before we jump in, I thought maybe we would have a little conversation about you, about your writing. You know, what motivated you to share your experience in this way? Does that sound good? Yeah, it sounds perfect. Um, so, you know, when I was, um, it was about 11 years ago, my son, Riley, who, um, he's my, um, my oldest son at six years old, had a um, brain hemorrhage and it was from an AVM which is an arteriovenous malformation. It's a rare birth defect that um, they don't know how they're formed, but um, it's basically a mass of malformed vessels 
that can bleed or um, hemorrhage at any time. And um, so we didn't know this was something he had until he was five years old and he had his first bleed. And um, so it was something, unfortunately, that wasn't treatable that um, because of its large size and also um, the location in the brain. So um, basically, when, um, about when he was six years old, about a year and a half later, he had his, um, a bleed that took his life. And um, he has a younger brother, Desmond, who was two at the time, who's in this photo, that uh, is now 14. And um, so I'm trying to think of what else to say about that. Basically, um, I started writing poetry the night he died. Um, I remember standing in my kitchen and I heard a voice in my head that said, write. And so I sat down and I wrote my first poem. Well, it actually wasn't my first poem. It was like the fifth poem I had ever written. And um, hmm, I need to take a moment. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think I'll, I'll take a breath with you if that's okay. Yeah, I wasn't, you know, it's interesting because even though I've shared this story so many times, it sometimes it just hits me in a different way. Yeah. No, yeah. I completely understand. We're and we're a new, new audience, new friends, new community. Um, and I'm curious to know what was your experience with writing even before all this? Did you consider yourself to be a writer? You know, yeah. Um I always wanted to be a writer, but when I was um, in grade school in fourth grade, I think it was probably like around fourth grade, I wrote a story, a fictional story. I made up a character. Um, her name is Kira, and it was about um, it was about she had taken her own life, and um, basically, I just was very empowered by the experience of, um, creating a character and a world for her to live in. And I remember just kind of loving the writing experience from that. And then in college, I studied journalism and discovered the poetry of Dorothy Parker, who I loved how, um, you know, like her wit and her pithy comments. And, um, and I remember thinking, you know, that I'd, I'd love to be a poet, but I could never write poetry, but maybe I could be an editor. <laughs> hmm. um, but it was funny to think that, that I thought I could be an editor if I like, couldn't be a writer. So it was a funny, funny thing to remember. Um, and then when Riley was about two years old, I had a calling to take a writing class with um, the poet and playwright Jack Grapes. And um, I remember standing in my kitchen and watching my husband and my son, Riley, run around and thinking that, um, you know, someday that he wouldn't need me as much. And then I need, um, I didn't want to be consumed by motherhood, that I wanted to um, have something else. And so I yelled out to my husband, I'm going to take this class. And he's <laughs> like, okay. And it was kind of a big leap for me. And, um, but I started, I took, started taking the class and I started writing about motherhood and, um, you know, just struggles with motherhood and about funny things that happened with Riley. And, um, you know, now it haunts me because that was like kind of once when he died writing, it became my lifeline. Mm. You know, I um, basically had a journal, like a moleskin journal that I carried with me everywhere I went. Like, um, you know, I'd be sitting at a stoplight in the car and I'd write, start writing a poem, or I'd be in the grocery store and I'd pull it out and start writing, or in the post office. Like, you know, I felt like it was a way that I, um, a way that I processed my grief and um, the way that like things people would say. And um, it was a way to just be like, oh, why am I feeling this? And actually write, you know, and write it down. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of what else, there was something yeah. else I wanted to say yeah, about I mean, that. it, it but, sounds like writing did exist for you in some ways, you know, before this, I think it's very funny, that belief that you could not be a poet, but maybe an editor or some other type of writing. And then this really wound up being a big part of helping you with, um, processing your loss and sort of making sense and creating things about everything that was happening around you. 
Yeah. And I think it also, you know, for me, it was a way of an act of, yeah, creating instead of like destroying, like there was a moment, you know, where I was like, I felt like I just wanted to scream, you know, and just break everything. And, you know, and instead I wrote down, you know, I started writing instead of that. So for me, it was, it was a way of, instead of crying, I, I wrote because the crying didn't I think it was a combination of it didn't feel good to me and also was like, I didn't know if I'd ever stop sometimes, you know, like mm. there was just like, it could be ongoing. Um, you know, I actually, when I was, you know, planning the writing prompt for this workshop, I had um, one morning come out and I found this book on the floor and it's this book called More Beautiful Than Before, How Suffering Transforms Us by Steve, by Steve Le Leader. And I opened it to a page and it was the page, um, the chapter was abracadabra and it was talking about the power of words. And, um, and it talked about how like the ancients believed that words and words were things. There's no difference between word and object mm. and, um, and how powerful words are because, you know, um, I'm trying to think of how to explain this. Um, that they thought that I think there was in Hebrew they had they have the same name which is the same name for the object and the word and the idea like sticks and stones will break you know break my bones but words will never hurt me and just how not true that is because you know mm -hmm. the words are so powerful so yeah. words are powerful and we'll get to experience that in this yeah, workshop so today as well. <laughs> Um, so going from, I could never be a poet, maybe an editor to having your books published. What was that like? Um, it was incredible. It was, you know, for me, it's like, because I was a new writer and I was learning the editing process and submitting, you know, and there's a lot of rejections. So, mm. um, in a way, when I would submit my poems or, um, you know, my actual manuscript, it was, like a way of creating hope, which I think is, you know, for me was so important with the grieving process. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so when I, when I first, my first book, Vanilla Milk, when it got accepted for publication, I was just elated. It was, you know, it was cause it's just, it's something, I think I had sent it out. Like, I, don't, I have like a list of like, maybe like 40 places. It's not, you know, it's not an easy thing to get something accepted for publication, especially a poetry book. But um, yeah, so it was published in 2013 by a small press in Los Angeles called Silver Birch Press. And then it's a collection of poems and short prose pieces. And it's all within the first two years of grief. And then my um, second book, which is Smile or Else, and I feel like I should be showing these books. Mm -hmm. but, um, so this was Vanilla Milk. And then this is Smile or Else. And um, Smile, Smile or Else won the Press 53 Poetry Award. And um, I still remember getting the voicemail on my landline <laughs> um, <laughs> asking me if the manuscript was still available and um, congratulating me on winning. So that was amazing. Um, it was just, and so smile or else is more the ongoing grief. So it was, you know, like after the first two years, you know, through, um, you know, just a few years ago, essentially. Mm. And I didn't think I would keep on writing, you know, but as, as the, as time went on, you know, grief, I feel like my grief aged and I actually have a poem about that, just how like it's like, you you know, I lost Riley and I feel like grief was born. And then I, it's like, you know, almost like grief went through the stages of child like development through mm -hmm. the years. Um, so and it's been 11 years now and it's just, it's, um, it changes. Yeah, absolutely. Still there. Yeah. I mean, we talk about this a lot in our centers, how our relationship evolves and changes over time. Um, you know, it's not the same as when it, it first started. It does change. Yeah. Yeah. And I think about, gosh, you know, writing these poems and I have no idea if you're a daily writer or what your schedule is like, but you know, these poems that are part of such an important part of your life and then just keep to keep sending them out and then to 
you know, have to deal with rejection too, which rejection about even the easiest of topics is probably incredibly personal and hard. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's, it, I think it's just something you need to, yeah. Um, just know that that's, it's not personal too, that it, you know what I mean? When you're sending out a piece of writing, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not good if somebody, if it doesn't resonate with someone, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah. It just hasn't found its home yet. Yeah. 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 So exactly. what motivated you to want to share your writing and try to help and connect with you know other people who are grieving? Yeah, I think, I mean, through the years um, after Riley's death, I've had, um, you know, a lot of people say to me that they found my work, my write, you know, poems to be very powerful, but they could never write like me. And, and I'm like, um, actually, you know, I think that um, every, I think everyone can write. And I know, mm. I, I know at one point I thought I couldn't write. And I also think that um, it's something that anyone can do and also that anybody can benefit from the healing, you know, aspect of it for sure. And I feel like um, it also just is a way to feel less alone and less isolated, mm. um, you know, and also a way to create hope and to, you know, continue to um, create. And then also, I think that um, I heard this once, and I really do feel that feel this way. And I, I think it doesn't matter what your religious beliefs are, but I do feel like when you think of your, you know, the person that died, when you tune in, you tune into their frequency, you tune into their energy when you're thinking about them and writing to them. And I do feel like it's, I don't, I don't think I realized this till years later after his death, that I was connecting with him every time mm. that I was writing about him, you know, and that's, yeah. that's huge to feel, huge. you know, yeah, to feel his, just feel who he was, you know, and is, yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you for bringing this you know, to our community today. I'm excited for them to engage with your prompts and, and write, because like you said, we all can write, um, you know, whether we believe it or not right now, by the end of this, if you all go along with the, the process during this workshop, you will have written or at least begun to write. <laughs> um, if it's all right with you, I'm going to put the slideshow back up. Is it all right if I show the other photos? Yes, of course. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. all right. Hopefully we're looking at the correct screen here. <laughs> yeah. Just let me know if you want me to pause or if you want to say anything about these. Um, you know, this was when Riley was, um, six, but right, this was after his first bleed, like just really like a month or month or two after we were taking holiday photos and it's him. And so Riley and Desmond, Desmond was two, he was six. Yeah. I like these photos. Mm -hmm. So sweet. And then your books. Yep. I know you held them up, but I wanted to show everyone the covers. We have these in our centers. Um, I have them in my office. We've got them in our lending library. And I really, I like this quite a bit. Yeah, this is um, a line from one of my poems that is um, the back of the Ellen Canto. And it just, you know, with time and grief, it's just such a surreal surreal thing where it just sometimes it just doesn't even feel like any time has passed and mm. but you know things have changed so much in other ways you know like the the you know like my son being 14 now I look at him you know <laughs> yes you have a teenager <laughs> <laughs> so now we are going to get into some of the work so I'm going to ask you all if you haven't already to grab something that you can write with, um, some paper, writing utensils, pen, pencil, crayons, markers. We're not fussy. Or you could open up Word or a Google Doc. And then before we even get into any of the work of our day, we're just going to ground ourselves. You know, we've been privileged and honored with hearing your story. I know you're going to all engage with your own personal stories. And people don't just come to 
a webinar about grief and poetry for no reason. There, there is probably a choice. There is probably some why or maybe even a who that has brought you here today. So I'm going to ask us all to just take three deep breaths. And as you're breathing, just really notice where you are, place, space, your body. And then you don't have to share, you could write down on paper or you could put it in the chat. You know, what or who brought you to this space today? And what do you hope to take away? You know, knowledge, tools, community, maybe a poem. <laughs> and then if you'd like, Share your why or your who in the chat. So what is your why? Who is your who? And remember, if you select everyone, it will go to everyone. If you just want to send it to us, that's okay as well. I see there's an anniversary coming up four years ago on May 18th. Husband and mom, husband. Thank you, and thank you for being brave. The children who attend your grief camps, your wife. Husband, yeah, we've got a lot of partners. Daughter, students. The families that we sit with here at Good Grief. Dad, sister, children. Oh, and you do bereavement work. That's important. That's important work. Thank you, everyone, for being brave, for sharing, for engaging with our community here in the chat. We'll have other opportunities uh, to connect with one another. And if you're still gather gathering your thoughts, that is okay. Feel free to keep going in the chat. I like this one a lot as well. Grief, another word for love. So this is going to transition into a section called the power of words, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Evelyn. I realized I had myself on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this I I this is a, a line from my one of my poems, What We Choose to Believe, that's from Smile or Else. And um yeah, so the power words. So this, you know, basically when I thought about a prompt for this event, I was thinking that um thinking how the like my res like my response to the outside world is you know a part of all like kind of a thread through all my writing um it's like an overriding overriding theme about how my grief is triggered and also how my perspective changed so greatly um after riley's death like everything that i heard or saw was filtered through like a new lens that i hadn't had so it, mm. it was very surprising and um like shocking sometimes that something would say somebody would say something to me that seemingly was innocent and wouldn't have had a, an effect on me prior to his death that all of a sudden was something that i was just like why am i feeling this way so that's why i think this is um this is a good prompt for that. Um, so we are going to start with just thinking of a question that you were asked or something that someone said to you after your person died that triggered grief. Um, and you can write it down. You also can share it in the chat box if you want to share. Um, so this could be something someone said. It could also be something that you overheard or witnessed too. 
And so we're going to take um, a couple of minutes for this, Evelyn. Yeah, we'll give it, yeah. give it the two, two minute countdown. Okay. <laughs> Unrelated, I already see some community happening in the chat. <laughs> and even if you don't share in the chat, be sure that you write it down. It'll be part of our process moving forward. I see the chat is starting to pick up a little there. I see, yes, well-meaning, that's the thing. Many times it is well-intentioned, but there is that impact. A well-meaning friend said, you have grieved enough. It's now time to turn a new chapter. How are the kids? How do you think? Yeah. <laughs> uh, at they least are, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say they are in a better place. He was in a better mm. place. That's one, yeah, very common one to hear. All the time, at least. There are very few empathic statements that are going to start with those two words. So I already know. <laughs> at least you didn't get too attached. Something was probably wrong too after my later pregnancy loss. Whenever I heard at least, I knew it was going to be rough. It's been two weeks. How come you're not over it? They're in a better place. Uh, she would have suffered more if she lived. Honestly, just people saying they were sorry for my loss or asked how I was doing. Even the sympathy cards were hard. So even those things that are sort of part of our social contract here, God only takes the best. Oh, yeah. Isn't it funny? The drop down menu on a form. Nobody expects that. And that that wave can just kind of kind of hit you. At least you have other children. That is that is one I got. I also got at least at least you have a husband and another child. Really? <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, so they've done a little bit of initial thinking. I guess it's now it's time for step two. All right, so for the second part of the prompt, um, we're gonna make a list of images you remember from the interaction that you, you may have written down more than one, but pick an interaction, something someone said to you or what you saw and make, you're gonna make a list using the five sentence, five senses of the images. So what did you see, taste, touch, feel in your body? What sounds were in the background? What did you smell? Smell is deeply intertwined with memory. Mm. Um, also, if you don't remember all of this, like clearly you can feel free to use your imagination and create the emotional, you know, the emotion, the emotional truth of it. Like what, um, what do you imagine you was going on in the background or what you heard. So feel free to use your imagination too. And I think we're gonna take like five, we think we decided five minutes on this, yeah? Three to five, you wanna okay. start with? Okay. We'll start with Start with three. Three, so we'll see how we're feeling.
And there is a question in the Q&A that I think will go well with the next slide. We've got some coming in through the, the chat, some of those sensory memories. I tasted and felt bitterness. I smelled tar. I could hear kids chattering around. We were in a restaurant. I felt prickly on my skin. So how are we doing? We've got less than 30 seconds here. I see some things coming in. I saw discomfort from them, tasted nothing, felt a lump in my throat, tingling and wanting to run away and get in my car. I couldn't hear anything but a buzzing in my head and ears. I, yeah, the buzzing, that's very, that mm -hmm. resonates, hearing the buzzing in the, in the head and ears. I think I had that today, actually. So we did have a question in the q and A. I I saw the, that about yeah. the milk, about my title. What, yeah, what's yeah. the meaning? You know, it actually is one, it's the title of one of the poems in the book called Vanilla Milk. And I mean, Riley just loved vanilla milk. There's these little horizon milk boxes, like those little, you know, yeah, ones. Yeah. they have chocolate and vanilla milk and um, he loved vanilla milk. So the poem was about, you know, when we were, he was getting his blood drawn or something and he was, I had him drink vanilla milk during the part. So he wouldn't know what it was. So he would just be, you know, not be paying attention to getting the, the needle. Mm. And he, um, and then there's also, it's a theme throughout the book. For some reason, it just comes up a lot in, a, in different poems. And um, my other son, Desmond loved chocolate milk. He didn't like vanilla. So, you know, that, that was interesting. Like after Riley died, I stopped buying vanilla milk and I would only buy the chocolate milk. So. Oh, thank you. So thank it, you. it somehow became the title. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, eventually art writing, you know, then it almost names itself. You know, it lets you know, I think how it wants to be known out in the world outside of your hands and your head and your heart. I agree. I agree. It's kind of like, it's like naming a child. It just kind of, you know, feels like the right, the right name, right title. Um, okay. So I'm going to read a few poems. A couple are, a couple are mine. And one of them is a close friends poem. This first poem is when a friend asks, it's called When a Friend Asks What I've Done with Riley's Clothes. And I wrote this poem after a neighbor um, who's another mom had this over shortly after Riley died. And, um, and she asked this question. And I think it was maybe, it was definitely not more than months after. When a friend asks what I've done with Riley's clothes, 
Obviously, something should be done. His clothes should not hang limp and useless as crippled limbs or hidden in drawers untouched. To whom should I surrender the blue shark t-shirt he wore on his sixth birthday? Or his favorite orange pullover, the collar frayed from his daily chewing? Or the charcoal gray sweater he wore eating his last bowl of vanilla ice cream the night he died? What should be done? Nothing, I say. We haven't done a thing. And then this next poem was written by a dear friend of mine, um, Alexis Ron Fancher, who I met in Jack Grape's class, that writing class that I started taking um, when Riley was two. And um, her son, Joshua, died from a rare um, cancer when he was 26. And she was the, the first friend that I made that had also lost a child after Riley died. And this is from her book called The Joshua Elegies. Um, and it's titled Over It. Now the splinter-sized dagger that jabs at my heart has lodged itself in my aorta. I can't worry it anymore. I like the pain, the dig of remembering, the way if I moved the dagger just so, I could see his face, jiggle the hilt, and hear his voice clearly. A kind of music played on my bones and memory, complete with the hip-hop beat of his defunct heart. Now, what am I supposed to do? I am disinclined toward rehab. Prefer the steady jab, jab, jab that reminds me I'm still living. Two weeks after he died, a friend asked if I was over it, as if my son's death was something to get through, like the flu. Now it's past the five-year slot. Maybe I'm okay that he isn't anymore. Maybe not. These days, I am an open wound. Cry easily. Need an arm to lean on. You know what I want? I want to ask my friend how her only daughter is doing. And for one moment, I want, to tell, want her to tell me she's dead so I can ask my friend if she's over it yet. I really want to know. Hmm. The powerful one. Yeah. Um, so this next poem I wrote, this is um, also from my first book, Vanilla Milk. And I wrote it um, while we were on a trip after Riley died, um, probably within the first year. And I was with Desmond and everyone, I, there was a day where I got asked, like, I can't even count how many times, like, you know, if he was my only child. And so I wrote this poem, wrote this poem there. Only one. Is he your only child? You only have one? Yes, one. Only, only, only one. Only lonely one. I used to have two. Now only one, I want to say. One died, I don't want to say. Two and then one. Only lonely one. Some little boys don't grow up. That's not always what they do. Some disappear, growth stunted, forever at size six, reduced to 44 cubic inches, the size of the urn. Only one, only, only, only one, only lonely one. So yeah, so now we're going to take about 10 to 15 minutes and write. And so we're going to write a poem about how you responded to the question or triggering words you heard. What did you say? What didn't you say? Is there something you wished you had said? It could also be um, in your internal dialogue. How did you emo emotionally respond afterward? And try using the question or words as the, either the title of your poem or as a line in the poem. Could even be the ending line or could be the beginning line. 
Um, and if you haven't written a poem before, don't worry about actually writing a poem. You're just writing a piece of writing. Um, so, and yeah, I can't, I'm trying to think if I should add anything else, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to chat them. I know 10 minutes probably felt like a very long time and then very quickly, not enough time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would, yeah, I would love to hear if anybody wants to share in the chat, book, chat box how that was, if that inspired some writing. And also if anybody um, would like to connect with me and email me um, what they wrote, I would love to see what, see what was inspired by this prompt. You know, we had one communication in the chat, and this one came very, very quickly. Oh, wow. Okay, mm -hmm. wait, I'm just looking right now. Should I read it? Do you want me yeah, to? Yeah, let's read it. Okay. Do you know what bittersweet means? Can you feel that I am happy for you? Can you feel that I am also not so happy for you? Will you understand that I can be glad and envious at the same time? I know you might think I am petty. I only know that I am a grieving, grieving mother. Wow. Mm. That's, that's powerful and so like resonates because there's that conflict that you have internally when you see something, you know, that someone like for me, like another child, the same age that Riley would have been or you know, graduating from high school, like right now he would be graduating from high school and there's a lot of friends who have kids who are graduating from high school and there you're happy, but then you have that feeling. So that resonates with me a lot. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, did you want to put your email in the chat in case there's anyone that wants to? Yeah, and somebody is, at, somebody is asking if they can read that there's aloud. Um, no, I don't think we're going to have any of the participants come okay. on to panelists, but. So share with, she can definitely mm -hmm. share with me. With yeah. you, or if anyone would like to put theirs in the chat, you know, we can read it aloud if they'd like. Very curious to see, you know, what came from this as well. Um, and even if you don't want to share what you wrote, um, you know, how was this for you too? I'm very curious to take this time. The time uh, so quickly so during this prompt, it really flowed for me because your sharing of the poems really helped me channel my feelings onto paper and write without judgment. Love that. And I want mm. to continue to write. I love that too. <laughs> yes. That's amazing. Please. Yeah. Okay. I put my email in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I also just, I, for years, I've been wanting to do this. I've been wanting to, um, do like writing sessions, grief writing sessions. And I just recently started um, to offer that where I would, um, you know, have a one-on-one -on -one session with somebody and we would, I would give them a prompt and share a poem to inspire. And then we, and then they would share in the session. So, um, so I'm that I'm available for that too. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. If there's okay. any other thoughts, reflections, questions, I don't want to hop right to next steps. Or poems. We'll take poems too. Yeah, I'm so, I just want to say, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to do this and share this writing prompt. And I love seeing that people are inspired. And thank you for bearing with me because this was all new to me. So um, <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Evelyn, for all the um, collaboration. Yes, of course. We were glad to have you be a part of our community. And for those of you that enjoyed writing, we've got some more writing coming your way next month. So we've got grief journaling. This is Dr. Nina Burma. She wrote a book called Grief, Growth, Grace, A Sacred Pilgrimage, and she's going to talk to us all about 
grief journaling. So that is June 8th. It's at um, 12 p.m. That's Eastern time. And let me put the registration link in the chat for those of you that might want to join us again next month. Also want to share some resources with you all. Your Good Grief has tons of free resources on our website, your blogs, articles, tip sheets. You know, we're always happy to share. You can also see uh, previous and future webinars will always be recorded just like this one and will make their way onto our YouTube channel. And we'd also like to know how this went for you. So if you have any thoughts, feedback, ideas for future webinars, uh, if you'd like to be contacted to learn more about uh, training or resources from Good Grief, please feel free to indicate it there as well. So we've got this QR code, um, but also if you want to follow the link in the chat, you can. Oh, I see we've got some poems coming through as well. So I think I'll put up our thank you slide. Did you want to read this one? Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. yeah okay. Seeing what people need. She would have suffered if she lived, you said, suffered through love, through her big brother kissing her nonstop, her dad blowing soothing, cool, damp air into her hair. She would have suffered through life, suffered through a family of which she is the center, suffer through finding love, friends discovering the world, suffer through being there for others. She would have suffered if she had lived. More, you tell me? More, you tell me, than because she died? Oh, that was um, hard. That, that one, wow. Yeah. That is so moving. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, thank so you. That was beautiful beautiful and powerful and i think just a testament to what you said at the beginning we everyone here today yes and can write and you did write um and when you think about it it didn't even take a long amount of time to generate something so so poignant so beautiful um so my hope is that maybe you revisit these prompts feel Feel free to utilize them. You'll have the, the PDF, whether it's in your personal life or with others around you. I saw some mention of grief groups and things like that in the in the chat. And I think that's what that's what we really, we really want is to give people these tools and these experiences. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you to all of our friends who joined us today. Um, it was really special webinar and I'm just grateful for your time and for everyone that joined us. Thank you everyone. Thank you Evelyn.